Okay. <laughs> Are we going to do this again? Are we going to make some paintings? I think so. Okay, here we are. <laughs> Good afternoon, everyone. Welcome to my studio. My name is Michael Markowski, and today we are going to look at the work of another one of my favorite artists. An artist, I'm sure everyone, even if you've been in a living in a cave your whole life, you've heard of today's artist. Today's artist is arguably the most famous artist of all time. We are going to look at the work of Pablo Picasso. And, and all week long, we're gonna be looking at the work of Picasso because today is the first day of Pablo Picasso week here as part of our master study series. So we are going to begin with pretty, I would say, one of his first most well-known pieces. Uh, although, actually, when it was completed, it wasn't particularly popular, but it is seen as, as really one of his uh, first major achievements as an artist. He did, Picasso is unique in that he, he achieved some renown at a very young age, and we'll get all into his biography in, in a moment here. Um, and he did make other paintings earlier that are really great paintings and are pretty well known, but this might be one of the first ones that is you know, sort of acknowledged as a masterpiece at this particular point in his time. And I think this, he would have been 19 or 20 years old when he made this painting. I mean, uh, he was a bit of a child prodigy, and we'll explain why, what the circumstances were that, that led to this particular, uh, why he became uh, a prodigy, right? He didn't come out of nowhere, right? So there is an outline that you can download for free from the Dropbox folder, and I'll show you that in a second. So I did this outline using the Procreate app on the iPad Pro, and you can download it for free from a Dropbox folder in the video description below. So you'll see there's a, a link, and inside that folder there's, I, th I think, over a hundred subfolders, of which these are all paintings by famous artists from around the world, all of which we have already done. So if you're just watching me for the very first time, and most people are, there's lots of content to keep you busy for a long time because we've been painting twice a week, usually Tuesdays and Thursdays at 4 p.m. Pacific time for over a year now. And obviously today's a Monday, so it's uh, because we're spending the whole week talking about Picasso. So it's a little bit of outside of my normally scheduled time. But again, you can see we did do a Picasso piece about a month ago to celebrate International Day of Peace. And so that was one of his famous dove images. We actually did two paintings that day. Uh, but this week we're finally focusing on Picasso entirely and his work on its own because on the 25th of October, it's Picasso's birthday. So we're, we're leading up to the, um, the moment <laughs> the anniversary of his birth. So if we click in this Pablo Picasso folder, you're going to see all these different files. So we're going to start right up at the top here. Number one here, you'll see there's three files related to the old guitar. So it's the name of today's painting. You will see an outline of the, or the outline and there's a JPEG version and a PDF. And then of course the original painting as well. So uh, I'll just let you know that tomorrow, this is the painting we're gonna be working on, Child with a Dove. And then on Thursday, because actually on Wednesday, we're gonna take a little side tour as a part of the paint the new series. We're gonna make a painting based on Bigfoot, the one of the most famous images captured or faked of Bigfoot. You be the judge, we'll talk all about it on Wednesday. Uh, I think we're gonna be doing that at 10 in the morning uh, Pacific time. So it's a bit of an unusual time just because of my teaching schedule. There is another painting here. So um, actually I should just mention, so we're, this is part of his blue period. This is the most famous, well, arguably most famous painting of the blue period. And then this is another painting associated with the blue period, but it does seem to bear some maybe more resemblance to some of the work that he was doing in the following 
a period of his work called the Rose Period. So these two jesters here. And then here's another one, the actor. This one I don't think I'm going to paint, but I did an outline there just for some people who wanted a little bonus activity. Uh, I think on Friday we're going to move into Cubism and paint this painting. And then I'll have to check the schedule. I can't remember what day exactly it is. It might be even be Monday on the on his actual birthday when we'll paint this Weeping Woman, which is a study for one of the images in Guernica. So lots of Picasso stuff. People have been asking about Picasso for a year now, and we're finally coming around to it. So uh, buckle up. Lots of content coming your way. Again, if you're watching me for the very first time, especially if you're watching the video after it aired live, you can go right to the very end. Take a look at the at the last few minutes of the program and tell me what you think. Did you did I do a pretty good job? Does it look like the original? And then if you decide you want to continue, you can come right back to where we are right now and pick up the feed again. Of course, you're watching me live. You know that there's no edits, there's no tricks or anything. You're going to see me make the painting from scratch, from a blank canvas, and work my way up to this. So you can also see how, if I do make mistakes, which I tend to, how I fix those mistakes and recover from them, which generally people find quite helpful, especially uh, beginners who, you know, once they make a little bit of a mistake, they freak out and just want to scrap the whole thing and throw the paints into the garbage. The great thing with acrylic painting is if we make a mistake, cleaning it up or fixing it, erasing it, and, and continuing along our way is very easy. So we'll see. There's plenty of opportunity for that in today's episode. So let's, before I launch too far in here, I just want to let you know that there's a private Facebook group just for people painting along with me. I strongly encourage you, if you're watching me, to join the group because there's like, a, I don't know, 125, 130 people at this moment who belong to the group already that this group formed organically it was something that people who've been watching for a year asked for so i created it and it's a great community of people who are maybe like yourself just starting out on their painting journey and some of these people who've been painting with me for a year were just like you at one point in time and over the past year have blossomed into incredible artists who are creating artwork completely on their own, inspired by ideas and images that they're passionate about. And that makes me so excited as a teacher of art to see this kind of transformation happening. So um, every month I go through here, collect a bunch of images and give some feedback. So I think that's gonna be this coming weekend. We'll take a look at some of this work. So I won't, but this is awesome. I just, <laughs> I love looking at, at this. Um, but let's push on here and just kind of quickly talk very, very briefly, because we'll talk about this while we've got plenty of time to talk about Picasso's life while we're actually painting. But Picasso Ruiz Picasso, uh, or sorry, Picasso Ruiz, Pablo Ruiz Picasso, um, was born in 1881 and lived to the age of uh, was 91. So passed away in 1973. I, I think there's probably a lot of people who might have thought he died 20, 30 years before that. Um, although he was painting right up until the very end. There's a, a few paintings that that were wet at the time he died that are they're, have become famous in their own right because of uh, being the the final touches of the great artist. Um, so born in Spain, died in France, he spent the vast majority of his life in France. Now over the course of the next week, we're going to be talking about different parts of his life. So I'm not going to go through the whole biography right now. In fact, I really just want to focus on maybe the first 20 years of his life to get up to where we are here. So I'm just going to skip down. Um, also in case you're wondering, cause there's a, probably a few people, um, who might say right off the bat well Picasso was you know undeniably an incredible painter super skilled technical artist but a very problematic human being a person uh, I don't think there's any dispute that could be had that he is a prototypical misogynist he was a horrible person to the women in his life he traumatized them he had many mistresses on the many women that he was married to you know i i think to, i have a two-year-old daughter and i think to myself like what would i do if she came home saying that she was dating picasso it would be like would i be really excited or would i just be absolutely 
like terrified because this guy was in many ways like he devoured the people men and women around him right we have talked when we talked about Picasso's peace uh, uh, dove uh, paintings and series he did a number of them over the course of his life we did talk about some of the great things that Picasso did um, especially deciding not to leave France during World War II and uh, which I think was like a very bold, courageous decision. And also just shows the size of Pablo Picasso's ego that he realized that he was so big, so famous that not even Adolf Hitler and the Nazis could get rid of him because if they had just dragged him out of the street and executed him like they did with millions of other people, that there would have been an international outcry. And again, as I mentioned before, the fact that some people would be extremely upset with Picasso being murdered versus six million Jews and homosexuals and people like uh, Roma people, like the fact that, that, that one person could be seen as being more privileged than other people is a whole other discussion, which merits like a PhD thesis or whatever. But let alone the fact that he did make a stand and it wasn't an easy period, but I, but I do respect him for that. Um, I, you know, there's a, um, I'll mention it when it comes, comes back to mind cause it'll drift in here, but let's, uh, just take a really quick, um, uh, mention here of his biography you know Picasso is sort of the textbook definition or at least was the textbook definition of a genius now I'm I've been super interested in, in notions of genius for a long time and I've been spending years doing research on it and there's a couple of great books about this but the most recent research over the last decade says that there is literally no such thing as a genius. All of the examples, every single one of them, and I know someone's going to leave something in the chat with a dispute about it, but people who've dedicated their lives to this type of research say that there's that really every case of someone being a genius is, is that someone had someone in their life who was already very highly skilled in the in whatever craft that that person ended up pursuing whether it was Mozart or in this case Picasso Picasso's father was an accomplished artist was a well-known painter who painted mostly birds and other animals in a realistic fashion so he would have and he taught Picasso how to paint starting from the age of seven he basically underwent an art school education. So I just ran home from Emily Carr University where I teach in the daytime, came home. Basically, his father was a, a, a well-known art professor and educator and curator at a local museum and sat Picasso down every day and was a very structured, rigorous approach to the point where Picasso was failing in other aspects of his schooling and so Picasso, by the time he's 13 years old, he actually enrolls in the same university where his father is teaching. And back then, it was generally most common that you would have very few young people would be in art school. Like I just came from class and most of my students are 17, 18, 19 years old. Even when I was in art school, most of the, the other students, students were in their mid-twenties they had taken at least a couple years off or a leap year so back then artists were sometimes would be in their late 30s early 40s and attending art school uh, often art school would be taking place at night and here's Picasso a 13 year old boy saddling up to the easel right next to all of these other people who've had other careers even and P P Picasso's painting next to them and you could also you could imagine you know we hear stories of these child prodigies and, and like child actors maybe in particular and the difficulty they have to adapting to society when they've uh when they've really essentially missed out on their childhood so i, I would say picasso would easily fit within that sort of framework of a, of a young person whose father was um really pushed him into making art so and and you know, it's one of those things. It's like it's hard to say that he he that you know, like what would you say? Like Picasso, the most famous artist of all time, created some of the greatest artworks of all time. 
him and his father did not get along. There was a lot of arguments, as one might expect from a father who's pushed his son into art. Uh, so is Picasso's father wrong for having done that? I mean, I certainly wouldn't treat my daughter like that. She, whatever she wants to do, she could do. But, uh, yeah, I mean, this is, I guess, the age-old question when it comes to parenting, right? That's a whole other discussion. Um, let's see. A couple of other major incidents that happened in Picasso's life. His sister died when Picasso was quite young. And obviously that traumatized the whole family. And Picasso, you know, uh, kind of throughout, kind of forever on, is becomes quite obsessed with death. And uh, many of his paintings feature, you know, um, uh, death as themes. Uh, and... Uh, and mortality so that's so anyway Picasso's living in um, he kind of moves around with his, his his parents throughout Spain and Barcelona and he moves to Paris with his good friend does it say in here anywhere or around the same time I, I, I all of this starts to get a little bit fuzzy for a number of reasons one of which is Picasso, especially as he gets older in life, he start, he kind of enjoys the 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 confusion that starts to arise of the murky details of his life and sort of plays with it. And when people would ask him, "Oh, did this happen?" "Oh, yeah, that happened." And he might even embellish even further and make up other stories. And somebody would say, "Oh, but I thought uh, you were in this city." "Oh, yeah, no, I was." And, and just walk away smiling, letting people argue it out. And he could care less. He was, <laughs> I, he really found that, I think, quite humorous as, as to the confusion that arose. So uh, there is around, so he moves to Paris around 1900, moves in with the famous poet Max Jacob. And does it talk about Cassis? Yes, okay. So here's... Um, one of his friends from Spain, uh, Casamagas, is another artist who is, uh, is really struggling with mental health and depression and ultimately commits suicide. Now, I thought Picasso was there when Casamagas uh, committed suicide because he committed suicide in this uh, uh, famous restaurant gathered with a bunch of other people. But as, as I was doing some other research later today, maybe he wasn't he wasn't there he might have not even been in France at all but either way Casamagas was Picasso's one of his dearest closest friends whom he shared a, a studio apartment with and when he died especially in the the violent horrific nature of a, a gunshot in a restaurant surrounded by dozens and dozens of other people it was like this traumatizing thing for everyone in in the in kind of the art scene at the time particularly Picasso and many people say that that was the stimulus for what becomes Picasso's blue period so I think maybe we'll just cut it right here and let's go right into the painting and we'll sort of talk about some of these things as it unfolds so what I want to do is I want to play a video because I've already done the outline and transferred it onto my canvas. Remember, as I mentioned just moments ago, you can find this outline in the Dropbox folder, right? We're starting with number one here for day one of the uh, Picasso week here. So let's, I'm just going to transfer this over here and I'll continue talking as this plays. So I'm going to be painting on a 9 by 12 sized canvas, right? This is a canvas board, which you can get at the dollar store. Uh, you can order them from Amazon. There's a link to uh, a few in the video description below, which I use. The, literally the same ones that I'm using. I do think the ones you, you get uh, from an art supply store or on Amazon are superior to the cheap one you get uh, at the dollar store. And they're really just an extra dollar. So instead of a dollar, they're two dollars. They they break down to a little bit better quality of the board inside, and are less likely to warp if you get a lot of paint or water on them. Okay, so I, you can see I use some carbon paper in between the original image, which I just printed out onto photocopy paper, and then I'm going to transfer this image. I just trace all around. 
I get about 80% of the lines on there. I don't need absolutely every one of them because we're going to be painting over some of this. All right, and then I pull the carbon paper out. I can take the tape off of this outline. And then I usually also like to recycle these drawings or I give them to our daughter to play with, to, to put crayon on, or most often these days just to chew on and create a little mess with. So uh, let's, uh, let's start getting some paint on the palette. So here's our image, right? Again, I can take this and find a new use for it because again if you this painting doesn't turn out the way you want then a good option would be just to try doing it all over again and I guarantee you the second time you do this painting it's going to be much much better so I'm gonna use some warm yellow here and I just have this in a jar because this is when after the tubes of paint which I'm gonna break out here in a second when they when they're almost out I just cut them open and scoop it out with a spatula into a little container like that so no paint goes to waste and uh, but I'll get the tubes out so if you want to see exactly the colors that I use um, and I've been using on this is the hundred and forty third painting that I've done using the exact same palette the exact same technique we've done the Mona Lisa Emily Carr's paintings Frida Kahlo, Artemisia Gentileschi paint, like, I mean, Salvador Dali, uh, Andy Warhol, we've done them all with this very simple limited palette, which is known as a split primary palette. If a bunch of this sounds like, you know, as we start painting, it sounds like it's way too complex. I'm doing my best to try to keep things simple, but if I do go to, if I'm going over your head while well, I'm redoing the entire um, intro to painting course beginning in January, the very first week of January. So if you want to join me for that, put it on your calendar, like and subscribe to the channel so you won't miss those episodes. Now I already did film that series and many people, obviously there's lots of people that, that watched it and followed along to get to this point. But you know, over the past year I've learned a lot and I want to kind of go back and incorporate some of those things that I've learned into some of the most early episodes to help uh, uh, people be just beginning the journey so the other thing you see them using this warm yellow to get the painting started you don't have to do this traditionally artists instead of using a warm yellow would use a warm brown so kind of like a rusty red, warm red color. And that works great for uh, what we call the imprematura, the Italian word, because the Italians were the first to do it, uh, to put down a colored ground on here as the foundational layer for your painting. You know, there's a lot of people, particularly today, who don't do this, who will just launch right into painting directly onto a white canvas. Why do I do this? Why have I been doing this for on almost every painting thus far over the past year? It's because, I mean, there's so many different reasons. One of which is just great just to get some paint on here. And I've done them, I've done a few where I've actually painted the traditional brown and painted the yellow and by the time the paintings are almost done there's almost no difference there is a difference it's not like there isn't a difference but is it you know immediately noticeable to the vast majority of people probably not most people would be like oh one looks a little darker than the other i bet as far as the rest so i, I use the example it's like the difference between um playing a, a cd or an mp3 a digital audio file versus putting a record on I have a record player because most of my friends are musicians and they could stand that I would be listening to music on my phone. And honestly, I rarely use the record player because it's such a pain um, to set up. So it's not a, that big of a deal to me, but I can understand why some people make a big deal out of it. So same sort of thing with this initial ground layer. The other thing I like about it is that it gives everything a bit of this it's a little bit of a warmer 
kind of uh, quality, kind of like an Instagram filter, I guess. Which I like. I just I want my paintings in the ones that are in my house because I hang these things up in the house. <laughs> my wife, there's paintings everywhere in this house, so I've got a lot of paintings we've done so far, and so they're taking over the house. But uh, if I'm going to surround myself with paintings that I love, then I want them to be as sort of uh, livable as possible. If such a uh, a an adjective exists, a livable home. Um, now, I don't. I haven't thought about how to make today's painting, so I'm not. I haven't really thought about the colors that I want to use. I do think we'll probably end up using most of the colors that are in uh, are are on this palette, despite the fact that we don't have any real bright reds and everything, but we do have some browns in here and brown is made with red and we can also modify the blues with with reds and yellows as well so even though this is the blue period it doesn't mean that picasso didn't use other colors i mean i've heard people say well he only used blue because he couldn't afford other colors i've never really seen uh, that that i think that's that's kind of a bit of a myth because clearly he used other colors in there and yeah I, I, I was doing some research like why exactly did are all the blue period paintings blue um he was in a very depressed state of mind at the time it's no secret he was and he was it's kind of the spiral that he was on. He was making these blue paintings, mostly of poor people in and around Barcelona and then later Paris. And um, no one wanted to buy them. So, like, surprise, no one wants to buy a painting of a homeless man begging for, for change on the streets of Barcelona. Now, I'm sure people, any, people would be more than happy to have this painting in their home now that's probably worth probably 200 million dollars if you could afford it but at the time when P Picasso showed up to his art gallery with a whole bunch of these blue paintings of homeless men and uh, uh, female prostitutes which were the two major subject matters of the, the blue period his his dealer who was a famous art dealer Ambroise Villard I think was like oh, man how I you know, like dude how am I gonna sell these things like Who's going to want one of these paintings, right? So uh, that further spiraled Picasso into depression because now he was starting to get, you know, he was, fell down the the poverty uh, line, under beneath the poverty line, and was, you know, scrounging for his meals. So the irony is that he's painting these homeless people, and he's now on the verge of being homeless himself, right? So... Uh, um, yeah, so let's, let's, uh, I think I'm gonna, this is almost dry, but I'm gonna blow dry this really quickly, so I'll mute the microphone for a moment, and then we'll get right into the... Okay, so that's uh, nice and dry. I just I'll just address a couple things I just saw there in the chat. Um, Lolly was saying, uh, I often wonder what you did with all of your paintings. I wondered where you found room for them. I love that you've got a, a mini art gallery at home. So I'll just show. So I've got three of these bins full of paintings. Right, you can even see here's. The Alma Thomas painting that we did 
back in February of was it this year? It seems like the I don't know. So here's a, this is I think the the box one of the master study. I've got one of the the intro to painting course, and there's another one that's almost full of the of, of to taking us up to right now. And just so you know, like what I've done here. I, this is actually just wax paper from the dollar store, which is not archival. It's not the best way of organizing paintings, but I've just taken some wax paper and put some of these paintings in, in here because these paintings will stick to one another if there's nothing that's separating them. And so you might find if you've got a whole bunch of these paintings in a box and they're sitting there for a few weeks and then you go to pull them out, they could be stuck together. That acrylic wants to kind of stick to things, right? So you got to be kind of careful. A product that I've got that I, I've been using for the most recent series of paintings is this. These are called, this is Glacine. Glacine is a, um, it's like a, it's kind of like an archival wax paper I guess and they're really thin sheets of paper that have no uh, uh, they're acid free and they're used in museums and um, for storing books and and documents um, sometimes you'll see like really expensive artworks in these folios and they'll have a sheet of glassine like that in between to protect the surface right so if you want to kind of upgrade getting a little bit of glassine bags and those I, I ordered off of Amazon right so I did a whole bunch of research until I found some that I really like uh, another thing Heidi says uh, your class today coincides with the uh, Art Gallery of Ontario again there happens to be a new exhibition there called Picasso painting the blue period you did it <laughs> with uh, the AGO's Matthew Wong exhibition a few months ago that's cool so uh, I, I did not realize there's a Picasso show um, at the Art Gallery of Ontario in Toronto. A great museum. If you've never been, one, it's probably, arguably, the best art museum in Canada. <gasps> what about the National Gallery? I don't know. They're, they're, they're kind of on par. The National Gallery is maybe a little bit more inclusive broadly for the entire country, whereas the AGO uh, is focus is not just on... Um, Canadian art, but on art from around the world as well. Okay, so let's get into the painting. And let's look at this and just think about how we want to begin here. Oh, I also see people saying congrats on your 10,000 subscribers. I didn't even... I knew sometime that was going to happen. I don't even know what I'm at right now, but that's... Thank you for, for pointing that out, Maria and Lolly. Um, and thank you guys for subscribing, for joining me on this painting journey. I really do appreciate your support as subscribers and also the contributions that many of you have been giving. There's a brand new light that I just got uh, ordered on based from donations that you guys have contributed. And if you want, there's a PayPal link in the description below if you want to uh, join one of the great supporters of the channel. Okay, so when we look at this painting, where are we going to begin? So usually what I do is I start in the background, and then I work to the foreground, go back to the background, finish the background, and then go back to the foreground and, and finish the painting. So that's probably the, the route that I'll take today, just looking to see if there's anything particularly strange or different that I want to do. This painting was painted over top of at least one other painting. So Picasso, again, this is a period of extreme poverty uh, where he is on the verge of being homeless himself. So he's recycling canvases. I, I don't know if it comes across here, but can you see a face right here? There's an eye, there's another eye, here's some lips, here's a chin, here's the top of the head, right? Um, that's a chest and a belly or something here. There's a leg. There's another leg here and some feet down at the bottom. So if what might originally just look like drips or splatters, there's another painting that was underneath there. There's people who've done x-rays of all this, so if you're really interested in finding out what the original painting is, I'm sure it's all over the web somewhere. 
but I'm just so I, one thing we could do if we really wanted to kind of try to get this painting uh, as accurate as possible is we could put down some heavy gel uh, which is a product so here's what we call oops, heavy gel and this is extra heavy gel <laughs> Essentially what this is, is it's you mix it in with your paint. If you want to get paint that looks really thick and goopy and for it to dry thick and goopy and and have like, you can even shape it, you'd want to mix some of this. So you, potentially what we could, I, I'm not going to do it because there was enough stuff to do for today, but we could paint some shapes and lines on top of this image right now. And then at, when we paint over it, we would see the same ghosted images coming through again i'm not going to do that but if you want to if you want a little bonus work and you want to have a little bit of fun you could get some heavy gel or extra heavy gel and put that on the canvas to begin with so i don't think anything i don't see anything that's going to throw me a curveball here um, looking at it i don't think he painted the warm yellow that i've got down here i don't see any of that coming through here um, which, you know, for some people, like, oh, well, but why did we do this? Because I, this is a technique that I've been using for the past year, and part of me teaching these classes is I'm really trying to see if we can make this system work. And you be the judge, we've done 150 paintings almost using this system, and it seems to work for pretty much every painting. Uh, so I think he probably painted it on top of the white that he would have put over top of the previous image and just started painting directly on there. But I don't think it's going to make too much of a difference if we use it in, in this, the process that I'm about to do here. So let's just launch right into this and start mixing some color. Now the background color is going to be a, a cool blue. So really, we've obviously we've got lots of blue in this picture, but we want to try to use some of the principles that we've been using so far. So by putting a cool blue into the background and then warmer blues into the foreground, we should get a little bit more depth. I will say that even we've got this actually looks what we this actually looks like a cobalt blue with white and cobalt blue is is actually kind of in between our warm blue and cold blue. This here is a warm blue for sure. And actually his clothes, this is a cool blue. This is a this is more of a cerulean blue with a little bit of warm red. And we'll show you how to mix that. So that brings up an interesting quandary just for me as an artist and teacher is do I want to paint this painting exactly as Picasso painted it? Um, it? Because in here, and Picasso knew how to use warm and cool colors. Picasso, his father would have given him the strap if he didn't master the, those techniques. So Picasso is, by this point now, moving away from the more realistic style that his father taught him just 10 years before, and is now starting to play with warm and cool colors and literally inverting them for what ultimately becomes cubism about eight years later after this period so my question is do i want to use picasso's colors and in, and using warm colors in the background and cool colors in the foreground or do i want to paint the painting incorrectly and use cool colors in the background and warm colors in the foreground oh i don't know i t so my question in my mind and i'm just thinking out loud right now without having obviously done any planning is does it is it important that we follow his him inverting these colors I think it might be today. Today might be the first time where I where I actually do put warm colors in the background and cool colors in the foreground, because I suspect Picasso is he's 
he's you know at the age of 20 as a rebellious teenager he's probably thinking about doing things deliberately wrong in order to create uh, probably in this instance a little bit of anxiety in the viewer where this shape the background shapes seem to kind of advance in front of the foreground shapes which is illogical right but again it prefigures what he does in cubism just a, a less than a decade later so do I do I really want to do that because if I do that I just am afraid of confusing people this is an intro painting class I will I'm gonna I'm gonna go back I'm actually I'm gonna paint it we're gonna put the cool colors in the background and warm colors in the, in the foreground so I'm, I'm just because even though that's not what he did here I'm just afraid especially if new people are joining this this video I'm sure will be seen probably by more people than most of the videos so I think it's important for people to to know how to paint before breaking the rules okay so my apologies I, I just wanted I'm, I had to work that through in my mind um, but you can certainly, as we paint here, you could you can invert these colors just as Picasso did. And I'm sure some of you, especially those of you who've been painting with me for over a year now, and this is, starts to become old hat, it might be really fun for you to do that version and then share it with us on the Facebook group and we could take a look at it and compare notes, right? We can think of ourselves as a little laboratory here. So, uh, in order to kind of do this painting as Picasso would have done, Let's take, I'm going to go from the background, let's take some cool blue. And I'm going to start painting, um, what should we do? Let's maybe let's start here. Cool blue. I'm going to put a bit of white in it. Because the white's going to dilute the strength of that color. And then I'm also going to take a bit of warm red. Now that warm red since it's across the color wheel from the cool blue, right? When we have these two colors, they're almost intersecting through the middle. They're actually technically a little bit lower here, but uh, maybe in fact, it's worth just showing this. Here's the actual color wheel that we've mixed on our very first class. We just took this warm red and just added a bit of it here. And you can see they're getting pretty close to what we call the neutral core, the center of the color wheel, where everything gets gray and, and super dark brown. So if we add a little bit of that warm red, we sort of neutralize the, the intensity of this color. Let's put a bit more, maybe a little bit too much. Take a bit. Now we have to be careful because we put too much warm red in here we're gonna get a purple, right? And we don't want a purple, we just want a really dark blue. And I think I will take a little bit of warm blue as well, because as I said, I think this is a cobalt blue that he's using, which is in between. So let's just take this color. And I'm probably going to do two coats of this. And if you want, you could start painting like the way I am. And if you decide, like, you know what, I think I want that, that warmer color back there. Then you could, on your second coat, paint a warmer blue there. And maybe I'll do that. Maybe at the very end of the day, I'll do that as well. So, I mean, if you're paying attention to, and you're listening to what I'm saying, as opposed to just skipping ahead, which many people do... You know, um, it'll the, all of this will make sense if you're not, then and you're just jumping around. Then it might be a little bit confusing as to why I'm doing what I'm doing. So you know, while I'm right here, I think which direction should we go? Maybe let's go add more white. And I'm gonna do let's do this right up here. Take this uh, white and and uh, blue. I'm going to paint this up here. Now you're probably going like, hey, wait a minute, that's absolutely wrong. Look how much darker his is than um, than the one you just painted, Michael. Oh, I, absolutely, for sure. But 
he there's many little layers of paint that he's painted over top of this so I'm laying this in first and then using a few different techniques we can darken that uh, using some glazes perhaps The other thing too is you can see Picasso is not too concerned about brush strokes showing through at this particular stage. So we'll leave that there. I'm pretty happy with that so far. Let's take the same color. Okay. And uh, let's see, any more cool blue? I, again, I think I'm going to paint all of the figure with a much warmer blue. So that we'll have a little bit more of a juxtaposition between warm and cool colors, and that figure will pop a little bit more from the background. So let's think how we want to proceed here. I think. I think what I want to do is let's mix a much darker color. We'll mix like this. We'll make a, a dark, 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 dark color. So I'm going to take some warm red. And I'm going to need to get some more dark red. Or it's not dark red, sorry, warm red. Warm red, and I mean more cold blue here. Okay, so take this cold blue, mix it up with this warm red, this very dark color. I'm also going to now take a bit of cool yellow, and I mix this in here, and that's going to help just completely kill all of the intensity of the colors. Now it just turns into a bit of a mushy, dark color, which is perfect for this area on the right of the canvas here. Now, is it the exact right color? Uh, maybe not. But again, at this stage of the painting, the goal is not to get the color exactly right. It's just to start filling it up. Got this shadow here. You can see the size of brush I'm using for this, right? Some people are immediately into the tiny brushes. As you know, I am always talking about wanting to avoid the tiny brush until as late as possible so I don't get sucked down to the into the tiny brush um, trap. Right? I'm, I, I'm <laughs> just as I say that, I will go down just a little bit smaller here, to just to noodle into some of these details, but I don't want to, I don't want to go too far down this, because it's, then I'll end up trying to perfect all of this stuff when uh, I want to just keep on motoring forward here. Okay. So that's pretty good for just a couple first little brush strokes here. Let's now do the the ground down here. So let's just gonna wipe off this excess. We can use this again. We'll probably mix it in there shortly, but uh, before we do that, I'm just gonna wipe off the excess. I'm not even gonna bother cleaning the paint. Uh, let's mix a cold brown now. So again, I'm going to need a little bit more... Where should we do this? Usually, I, I'm about to open up a t this tube here and cut it open and get the rest out. But let me... I've already got a jar 
full of this paint that would otherwise have just gone into the garbage, right? Scoop it out. crumbs are coming off okay so now let's mix a cool brown and just we'll keep this up here so you can see the, oops, the, the color as it evolves so let's take a good healthy amount of cool red and let's take some cool yellow and obviously if we mix these together we're gonna get a cool orange Right, so we've taken the cool red is a magenta and with the cool yellow we've got this red which is cooler because it's also it's moving away from the warmth of so if we mix the warm yellow and the more warm red together we get a warm orange here we've got a cooler orange I'm also using a little bit less yellow because I don't want it to go totally dark or I do want it to be a little bit darker, not super, super dark, but, but dark enough. Because you can see that that area and below is pretty dark. Now that color is, is, is a really dark color. It's, right now it's kind of, it's very similar to this color. Right? We can, in fact, we could paint it right on here. Maybe we'll do that, we'll mix it again shortly. But let's add a little bit more warm red back here. take a bit more warm yellow All right so now it's gone a bit greenish greenish brown it means we just need to add a little bit more warm red and we'll just keep on toggling these I think that's we're getting closer into the zone here maybe that was a bit heavy on the let's add a little bit more yellow in here there we go beautiful right it's just managing these these ratios and once you get it it works and it can be a little bit of a pain in the butt but you can just sort of watch how mine unfolded and you can get there all right so now i got this beautiful cool brown and i'm going to paint that right down here in the bottom And once we get all of this in, we'll start zooming in. Oh, I just realized that, you know, the original painting, that foot is cut off, right? You can see. So I, we might have a little bit of room to actually include this foot. So. I also see it looks like this continues across here and I really probably should have done this earlier but there's no reason I can't do it now but if we were to imagine it won't be perfectly straight but Gonna make I think there's I don't know if that line continues back there I don't see that so I'm the reason I'm doing this is I'm gonna bring this brown up higher so this is a shadow that's being cast on the floor and bring that up there
Good. It still feels like it's a little low on the right side, doesn't it? So sometimes that happens, then you actually measure it and it's too high, but it's what looks right. It doesn't necessarily, just because it, it the measurement is incorrect doesn't mean it sh that it's, it's whatever, yeah, it's, if it looks right, then that's right. <laughs> the same sort of thing like when I'm hanging paintings sometimes and you get the level out and it's like okay this is level but there's no way that that's straight right just because the walls in, in an old house like where we live are a little bit wonky so it's like hang it so it looks straight because somebody might come in and that painting's crooked oh well no but it is level and they're like okay well it looks crooked so I don't know <laughs> what you want me to tell you um, oh, there's my good old friend Brian Batista, Brian Bunny. Hello, Brian. Nice to see you in the chat there. Brian and I went to art school together longer than than uh, than you might imagine ago. Okay. So you know I. As I'm thinking about this, I just washed my brown brush. I think I'm actually going to paint this whole background with this brown right over top of this dark color, which is going to make it go even darker. I think we'll probably paint another dark layer of blue. We will paint another layer of dark blue over top, but this is just going to help continue to push the paint or this area further and further backwards and make it look darker and darker right because the more layers are that are there at least if they're opaque layers and these are not entirely opaque but they're certainly not transparent the more layers that are there the less light can can go can uh, go through all the different layers of paint to down to the white surface and reflect back. So the dark, so the more dark layers are, that are there, it's sort of like you know the inability of light to get right down to the bottom of the ocean, right? But the, the thick, the more water, the volume that's there. Okay. So And I think I'm just going to add a little bit more of this round paint here. Because sometimes, you know, when I'm painting around these little details, the paint gets a little bit thinner than it might be in other places, and it can just look a little bit lighter. So I'm just concerned that I don't want um, this space inside to look any different than the area around it, right? Okay. Cool. So I think let's take a break from the background and move to the foreground now. I'm just going to clean off these brushes again. It's time for a sip of tea. <laughs> Good to stay hydrated, right? The brain can't function if it's doesn't have any fluids in there. So level up with a little bit of water in there or tea or coffee. Maybe some wine or whatever, but you might find you get a little bit tired by the end. So, okay, now let's move into painting these uh, warmer colors. Now again, just, so, just to completely reiterate, because the results I get are going to be a little bit different. I made a strategic decision to actually invert the colors that he's using here, just to kind of go back to foundational painting theory 
is putting cool colors in the background and warm colors in the foreground. Picasso here is using, this is definitely a cool blue on these pants. This is a bit of uh, probably a cobalt, which is in between, and this is definitely a warm blue in the background. So, um, you'll also notice that there's a bit of this greenish uh, color cast on here. I'm going to do that as one of the very last things in this painting. So, uh, just be mindful. I'm going to, I'll actually paint everything and then we'll probably do a little bit of a glaze with a bit of yellow or green over top so let's get our blue and you know what actually before I even go further I'm gonna take this dark color and do a little bit of line work on the face this I, I you've seen me skip over this step many times when I'm painting portraits, just because that's what I'm used to when I'm painting on my own. But if you're painting this and you're a bit of a beginner artist, ju jumping right to that point might be a bridge too far. So I'm gonna take this blue. It's the same blue that I used to paint this area. Right, Still, I still got some wet paint on there. And I'm gonna just go around really quickly and paint in some of these details. I'm not gonna do all of it, but in case I lose a little bit in this next layer of paint, I'll be able to find these landmarks. So I'm just going pretty quickly because the goal is not, this is not a final outline. It's just to help me. Let's just go to these feet really quickly. Look how long these toes are that he's painted. it's good enough right it looks maybe a little bit kind of it's very loose but that's the point it's really just so I, I don't lose those lines you but even if I did lose those lines I still have the basic composition in place right you should never you know become too dependent on your outlines otherwise you you're gonna lose the, the pleasure of painting of just sort of having a little bit more freedom 
Who cares if it doesn't look exactly like the original, right? Picasso already painted this painting. You get to do your own version of it, right? And yeah, obviously part of doing these master studies is to try to replicate and learn from, or really more, not just rep, not really the replicating, but learning from the original artist. And if we can, whatever we happen to get out of it, that we learn from it, that's important, right? It might be, what we talked about the using the warm and cool colors in the so-called incorrect way that he's done which again I'm not doing but that would be if that's what you come away with and then you paint this in fluorescent pinks and greens that would make me very happy as well so uh, let's mix the this next color which let's mix let me use a slightly bigger brush so To do the, like the, let's do, what should we do first? Let's do the clothing, I think, first. So maybe less white. Let's take some of this warm blue. And I'm gonna modify it with a little bit of warm red. Not too much, otherwise it's gonna get a little purpley. Although it won't go super purple. <laughs> Not super purple. But it will go a little bit purple because it's not if I really want a really nice purple I would have used the cool red in the warm blue but I'm, I'm using a warm red here with warm blue which is going to just get take a little bit of the punch out of this and even take a little bit of cool yellow mixing in here Now we get this blue, which now looks a lot more like a cobalt blue. That's perfect. That's a great color. It actually looks pretty darn close to this color here, if you wanted to use the, that color. But um, Should we proceed? I think what I'm going to do... I'm just going to put this color all over these pants and then we're going to lighten and darken as we go later on. So I, one thing I, you might see already with this image is that there's a, all of a sudden a, a, a way more space in my painting than there is in Picasso's painting, right? And I'm not saying that I'm better than Picasso, I'm just saying that he's using, he's playing with the, the warm and cool colors in a way that I'm not. I might later regret having done this, but we'll see. I just realized I forgot this area in between. So I'm gonna paint this cool blue that we had, the same one that we used up here. Paint that in there, and I'm gonna put some brown over top of it as well momentarily, but. Okay, let's go back to this dark color.
So I can still see this line in between his armpit and his body there, right? Maybe while I'm right here, let's. I'm just gonna use this same warm blue to get the inside of that guitar. His ear. Okay. Maybe even take this same warm blue, just outline that leg a little bit. Okay, so now we've got another layer on here. Let's do the, the, the blue of his skin. So let's, first of all, let's just see how this looks if we add a little bit of white to this color we've just made. Let's see it goes a little bit purpley. Well, it might, it might be just from that area of it. So right now it's got a bit of a purpley color because we did put some of that warm red in there. So he's definitely, see, all of this is all cool blues. Okay, let's take a bit of cool blue and put it in here just so you don't completely lose that color. So what I'm looking for, I'm actually going to paint a little bit of the darker skin tones here. That's kind of the color I'm looking for. So actual color or where the light is coming from in this painting is a little bit hard to, to pinpoint it's kind of strange um, so I'm not exactly sure So right now I'm painting what we call like the local color, the dark color, or not the dark color, but the kind of the middle value. And we're gonna get some darker and lighter colors or values in here as we go. just take this paintbrush and wipe off as much excess as possible and let's just get some white with almost with very little paint just the excess paint that I had on my brush I'm 
You can see how I'm holding my paintbrush? I'm really high up. Boom, a lot of my details are gone. At least for right now, as the paint dries, it's gonna come back a little bit. But uh, I'm also, I like the challenge of trying to... The other thing too is when you get rid of some of the outlines, as frustrating as it can be, it's also for me just kind of freeing it's like okay well now I don't have to be a slave to those lines I can you know practice eyeballing them a little bit have a little bit of fun it's going to be now of course it's going to be a little bit different so it's sort of like oh whew, okay now I can just indulge myself rather than worry about making it perfect So next, let's do the guitar. The guitar is going to be a warm brown. So let's take some warm yellow, warm red, and we'll make a warm orange. Remember the difference between the, the cool orange we made when we made this cool brown here? All right, let's take some warm blue and mix that into this color. Be good. I'm gonna need a bit more and more red. It's an, it's a little bit on the brighter side of things. I don't mind that just yet. Again, we can always darken things, or darkening is a lot easier than lightening things. So I'm gonna put this in here. Now, and then if I want to modify it, I will. And then let's now take uh, a little bit more blue, mix it into here, a little bit more red, get a darker brown. So I'm really, really happy with where I am at this point, this stage in the process. 
So I've got all of the main things in place. My color, my background, foreground, everything's been covered with paint. There's no white left on the canvas. I mean, there wasn't white left on the canvas about 20 minutes in because we put some warm yellow over. But now even that warm yellow is at least, it's it's still, you might say it's invisible, but it's it's actually there whether you're consciously aware of it or not because it's also mixing optically with the colors that are here. Uh, which means that like the light penetrates through the top layer, hits the bottom layer and then bounces back to our eyes and our eyes are seeing it even if we're not aware that we're seeing it. Now remember I painted this the dark blue. I'm just going to paint this same brown over top of it just to darken that area a little bit more. Now, you know, actually at this stage, if I did, I could still invert the colors and have my warm color here and cool colors on his out on his clothing and even on his body. And if anything, actually, this would be probably the, the a, a better solution to at this point, because now we've got our warm and cool colors established, but by adding some of those opposite colors on there, it's not going to have quite the dramatic effect um, that actually, cause yeah, I think that's, this is probably actually pretty close to what he would have done. In fact, I bet you he did something pretty close to what we've, we did so far. Um, okay. Which begs the question, should I actually do that? <laughs> People are going to get sick of me flip-flopping around today, but um, it is a bit of a... It's a really interesting problem or situation to run into. Because hmm. we could put a, a warm blue right here, and it would look really good. Um... Similarly, we could put this warm green down here, warm greenish brown over top of that. Hmm. Okay, I think I'm going to change my mind again. <laughs> I think I am going to use the the. So now, okay, this is this is what I've shown you so far is the traditional process for painting. For painting figures, for painting landscapes, this is what Picasso would have learned as a boy at age seven until thirteen when he went to university to study art with his father. This is exactly the process thus far that he would have used, and I'm I'm actually pretty sure as the more I look at the painting that this is probably what he actually did as well. Then what he's doing is now inverting some of these colors by now putting some warmer colors in the background and cooler colors on the foreground and I think what that does is it creates a bit of of a strangeness to the painting where it's not just a painting of a homeless man playing guitar um, with whose clothes are tattered and is emaciated he's clearly starving um, but he's also using the colors and playing with the warm and cool colors to create a, a, an attention that is maybe not, that, that the vast majority of people aren't aware of why that's happening. And I think that's because he inverted the, those warm and cool colors. So I think I'm going to do that. My but and I'm not, I don't really should apologize because I think this is, um, we're on the trail of Picasso as we do this. And I think you'll see a transformation happen pretty quickly as we move into this next step here. I also think at this point I'm going to be using much smaller brushes because Picasso at this stage is not concerned with um, with hiding his brush strokes, which is what you traditionally do if you're painting in a more classical, naturalistic style photorealist style you don't want it to look like a brush touched the canvas you want it to look like it's like 
came right out of a camera to be photorealist, right? That's not what Picasso is doing here. We see, you know, brush strokes visible everywhere. We can literally see the brush strokes of the painting below it in there as well. Okay, so maybe just to, so we can see how this unfolds, let's take some of this cool blue. Sorry, warm blue, my apologies. And we'll just modify it a little. Oops, sorry. Let's get this view here. So I'm taking my warm blue, and you remember this is the color that I mixed with a little bit of warm red in here. I'm just going to get a bit of that on it. Not too much. But let's take it and then paint it. You could see that there's that color is this is basically we've matched the color exactly now he's also gone a, done another layer over top of it which is darkens it even more and I think we'll get there but we'll do just like he did in a separate layer because we've got lots of like what's one thing Picasso is famous for doing is for layering paint getting nice thick layers of paint He would, one of his sort of approaches, it's a quote of his, and we, uh, how closely he actually obeyed this is up for debate, but one of the things that he would say is whenever he found a part of the painting he really liked, he would immediately paint it out with the idea that if it's really good, it's going to re-emerge and resurface. That might be a little, a little stressful for a beginner artist to do, and whether he actually did that is up for debate as well. Sometimes it could just be a provocative thing that he said. Um, okay. Uh, Donna says, are there any pictures of his father's paintings? I'm sure there is. Um, in fact, if I recall, the, the Pablo Picasso Museum in Paris has a great collection, especially of Picasso's earlier work. And I've been there, I've been there a couple times. I, I can't think off the top of my head, but I, 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 met, I'm, I would be very, very surprised if they don't have a few dozen paintings of his father's in their archive somewhere. Whether they're displayed at, at all times is another question. I, I bet you there's one or two of his father's paintings on display there for sure, just to help give some context to uh, Picasso's life. But, um, great question. I haven't really thought about it, but... I, there is some books that have some of his images in there. So I've got some white. I just put some more white on here. And what was... Oh, I was going to do some little bit of warm blue in the background. Now I think I'm going to take this off gray that we mixed earlier. Add, add it to the white. So just as I'm painting it, I'm just adding little bits more of darker paint.
I'm probably gonna do a little bit more of this later as kind of glazes, I think, as a really dark but thin glaze. As fun as that is right there. Same thing, let's take some of this darker warm blue. Remember, here's my warm blue, and I'm just taking this color. Another thing we can do is take like a rag and kind of just dab in and rub a little bit of that out. All right, same thing up here. And just gives like a little bit more of an effect that Picasso would have used as taking a, a rag with some turpentine on it and wiping paint on and off kind of thing. Okay. Looks good. So now let's go the opposite direction. We put some of this warm blue back in here. Now let's put some cold blue back onto the clothes. And that cold blue, it's got cold blue and we've got still a little bit of this warm red in here, right? So if we need to mix more, we'll put a little bit of that warm red. And you can see that's the exact color that he's used right here. We'll get to all of the folds and stuff shortly here once we get just the paint in place. It's all starting to slowly come together. Now let's take some white. I'm going to mix this over here. Just with the paint that was on my my tube. Or on my, my, my uh, paint brush. Let's just see how dark this color is. And there's a little bit of yellow. I'm not even sure how it got on there accidentally, but I don't mind. It's just sort of coming through. That's just a bit of cool yellow in the mix. Oh, I think it was probably on the white, maybe? But either way, it's okay that it's there.
Okay, and even though there's more to do there, I want to get this guitar and then move, uh, move on. So likewise, we've been using these now cool colors in the foreground. I'm going to take this cool brown that we made much earlier, and I think I'm going to start with a little bit of glazing fluid at this point. So if you've never used gl glazing fluid, it should be a definite addition to any acrylic painter's set. Right, a tube of this, I'm not sure how much it costs, probably around somewhere 15 to 25 bucks, depending on where you buy it from. Prices on paint vary widely. Amazon, by the way, often has some of the more expensive art supplies. So there is a link to this in the description below, but maybe before you buy it, just take a look at it and then see if you check out your local art supply store and see how much it is there. Because you might find it's actually this might be $40 on Amazon when it's $15 at your local art supply. I don't know why art supplies tend to be way overpriced on Amazon. Sometimes they're really cheap, as, but you know, Amazon isn't always the cheapest for everything, right? So I'm taking a bit of this glazing fluid. Actually, I should just wipe the excess paint off my brush. Here, let's get some more glazing fluid on there again. So got glazing fluid mostly and then a little bit of this cool brown. And then let's just sort of take it he's doing something like this here I don't know if I got I haven't quite got the color exactly the same but I can see that he's wiped paint off in this area For a few moments it's definitely still very very bright but a couple more layers of this and it'll get significantly toned down let's just take some of the brown itself just as it is and then just paint it Maybe why don't we just take a second of a break here. Since Donna mentioned it, let's take a quick look at Picasso's father. So here's an image uh, painted by his father. So you get an idea of the kind of work that he did and that inspired or that he the kind of thing that he was teaching his son how to paint, right? Let's see if we can find more images. Beach ball of death here, come on. I've never looked for Picasso's father's work here. 
Okay, so here, this gives you an idea. So you can see, I mean, these are all paintings that his father did, right? Here's another one of these paintings. Okay, looks like the computer's not wanting to behave, so I'm just going to move on. I see in the chat there, Paula says, sorry, what is glazing fluid for? Um, well, Paula, you've seen me use glazing fluid hundreds of, literally at least a hundred times, right? You've seen me use glazing fluid. I use glazing fluid all of the time. Almost in every painting we've used glazing fluid. So I use glazing fluid... Because, Paula, you've painted with me for, I think, every painting we've done so far. You've been with me, Paula. Um, but glazing fluid I use to uh, make very thin coats of paint, right? So if you want to make a, a layer of paint that is almost entirely transparent, you would use a little bit of glazing fluid. Glazing fluid you know, is most famously used in paintings like the Mona Lisa, Right? When people say oh, her smile is so subtle, is it a smile or a frown? It's The use of glazing fluid allows you to paint almost transparent areas of, of, of color that will hide your brush strokes almost entirely. If you do it properly and, and it takes a little, it's a technique that takes a bit of time to use or to learn. But I also often, you've heard me say, I use glazing. Glazing fluid is like the the timid painters or the beginner painters best friend because if you're afraid of putting a big dark brush stroke right over the middle of the canvas you can use some glazing fluid and dilute it and then paint it and then you're like oh it needs to be a little bit darker do it again oh it needs to be a, and you could do that 50 times until you get the color or the the, the density of, of of value that you actually want right Okay, so let's um, let's come back here and so I think let's do actually let's see if the if we can do another glaze on the guitar. I think it's sufficiently dry. I might put I guess I'm out of cool yellow here, aren't I? Let's sneak a bit of cool yellow in here. Should be a bit dark. So it's slowly kind of darkening down to the way we want it. I think on the back down here, I'm going to use a warm brownish green. Kind of an ugly green color down there. So let's take our warm yellow. Where, sh where should we do this? Maybe up here. Warm yellow and warm blue. So we got this kind of greenish color. Let's add a bit of, oh, it was a bit too much warm red. I didn't mean to go quite that red, but maybe we can keep it a bit more on the greenish side. There we go. Kind of got a greenish brown, right? And that's just because we have more 
warm yellow and warm blue in there. So it's a brown, but it's still kind of greenish. Almost kind of a bit like a, of a army green kind of thing. Right, and that looks like pretty close to the original. You tell me what you think, but that's... I mean, I, I'm, I can pretty much guarantee you this is exactly the, the, the method that he used in this area, for sure. Painted a, a brown and then went over it with another color, like this green, to modify it. Because we don't... it's not just a brown there. It's, it's been modified again, but this is something Picasso did very often. Even though that did lighten up this area, I think I'm going to keep... I like that there, though. And then we'll darken it down on its later on. Put that shadow back there. Same thing in there. I mean, it's funny to me because I'll do a little bit here. And I'm like, wow, that's a radical change. It looks a lot more green in person. And I look at the can on the canvas screen, and what you're seeing, I think what you're seeing is like, oh, I'm not quite as. It doesn't look what it looks like here in person, but that's okay. Uh. So lots of comments in the chat here. Uh, Carlito says, hey, 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 Markowski, I couldn't paint along today, but just want to say that you have a good eye when it comes to recreating the world's greatest masterpieces. Thank you so much, Carlito. I appreciate that. Um, I would love to see your version of today's painting or any of the other ones we've done. Um, uh, Gail says, so in the old days, what did they do as I doubt they had glazing fluid? No, you're right. They did not have glazing fluid because Picasso was painting in oil paint. Uh, acrylic paint didn't really exist, at least wild, uh, widely available until the 50s, 1960s. Um, so he was painting in oil paint. And in oil paint, we don't have strict glazing fluid. But you would use um, mediums like... Um, uh, Galkid or like linseed oil to create very thin layers of paint and uh, because linseed oil is basically the same thing that's that that is in oil paint so another way to think about this like glazing fluid is kind of I don't want to go too off on a tangent but When it comes to when it comes to acrylic paint, you have pigment and medium, right? Acrylic medium, which is basically a plastic, right? When it dries, it turns into a plasticky type of material, right? And so, if you want to, you can glaze with matte medium, which is just clear acrylic paint with no pigment in it, right? Glazing fluid is just a version of of matte medium that's just been chemically constructed in a way that that it dries a it takes a little bit longer to dry. Um, it uh, is a little bit clearer than than this. Sometimes the matte medium can be a little bit foggy. Um, so it's just made specifically for glazing. Uh, oil painters instead, because oil paint is, um, <laughs> I don't actually have 
the uh, the Galkid here, but Galkid is essentially like a linseed oil that's that is again that that's hard to like what is this it looks like this crazy explosive or something i just keep it in here because it because the, it will dry out over time so this keeps this nice and wet right this has been in here for years and still fresh right so acrylic paint its main binder is this and then in in oil paint the main binder is a linseed oil right and so if you want to glaze, you just use a lot more linseed oil, maybe a little bit of odorless mineral spirits or what artists used to use turpentine all the time, but turpentine is quite a toxic material, so people use OMS instead. Paula says, I think I got I got it about glazing. This time I'll try not to ask again. Sorry, it's the aging process. I don't mind. I was just I was a little bit surprised, Paula, because I thought like, oh I I'm sure we've talked about glazing fluid many. We've used glazing fluid in almost every painting, so you threw me through a loop there. I thought maybe I was having an aneurysm. <laughs> okay, let's get back into the painting here. So let's do a little. I want to do a little bit more on this guitar just because when. Um, Really, I, I, at this point, I want to focus, just dial down on the figure and finish there because we're, we're we're pretty close to having most of the rest done here. So here's this glazing fluid. I like a bit of this cool yellow in there. I think that helps. He's sort of just getting a little bit. It's still quite bright, but it's losing some of its the intensity of that warm brown that we put down here originally. So I'm going to blow dry this, and I'm going to mute the microphone for just a second because I want to just finish that guitar. Okay, let's try doing this one more time. Actually, let's that's maybe as close as I'm gonna bother with here it's definitely a this is a very warm brown that I put in there and it's maybe if I glaze over it with just a darker color later on we'll get a we'll remove some of the warmth in here the warmth isn't that bad is it dark uh, cold brown back onto here now um, let's we're, let, we'll do the, the, the skin of this figure 
and then we'll do the clothing because the clothing is mostly on top of the skin so it'll be easier uh, we'll, we can be a little bit more free painting the, the fabric after we've got the skin on there so probably I think people would be at this point you're like, oh, I don't know if it doesn't really look like this guy. So let's go in and deal with the face because that's what, what is going to trip people up the most. So once we get the face out of the way, I think people will be like, oh, okay, actually, this I think we're on track. Let's, that's good. <laughs> He's not as crazy and competent as we once thought. Let's see. So this color, and maybe I'm going to go down to smaller brushes. This is our cool blue, right? So we could take cool blue and some white. And if we want to modify it, we can add a bit of warm red. And that will turn it into a bit more of a grayish color. It'll get rid of the intensity of the, the, the cool blue. Although I, in this instance, I think we want a bit of that. Okay. So let's just see here. In fact, it's almost there's a bit of cool yellow in here. bit more cool blue into that white. Let's see, and this is warm blue back here again. So he's all he's flying all over the place in this painting. As I the more I look at it, and I see different things each time. So he's he's like breaking all the rules in this one painting. Okay, let's make a, a dark color again. Let's take our warm blue. Or sorry, warm red and cool blue. We'll make a, we'll mix these together. And I need some cool yellow on here a little bit, but so I'll we'll just get So this is my dark, dark color, and I don't want to use it necessarily all the time, but I can modify my dark color, my this cool blue, by just scooping a little bit of it in.
So we'll put some of these features back into place. You can see he really gives this severe cheekbone here, which really makes this figure look thin and emaciated, right? It's pretty intense. Like you would really give someone a cheekbone that in, that dark. Uh, and like look at how sunken in his cheek is right here. Said, I think so this is some warm blues and cool blues he's going back and forth between those colors which is very unusual into this Let's just get a bit more cold blue on here. Might be a little too much. all just like cool blues that I'm putting in here at the moment, right?
So I'm going to leave the head for right now. Let's just move on a little bit and so we don't get bogged down in one area. And there's John saying hello in the chat. Hello, John. back to the clothes. We'll get that little ratty part of the clothes in in a bit. In fact, maybe I'm just gonna try just blending this gently. I mean, that's without any glazing fluid either, right? If you get to it pretty quickly, you can do a little bit of glaze glazing fluid um, but you have to be pretty quick let me see let's work our way there So I'm not gonna. I haven't done any highlights here. I'm just going for some of the darker stuff so far. And again, I can just take my brush, try to soften a few things out if I want. Let's move down to the other hand. I did just add a little bit of glazing fluid to this because it's, this paint is getting a little bit sticky. We've been painting for a couple of hours and it's starting to kind of seize up a little bit. That's going to make this a little bit more transparent, which is okay because we can see there's transparency in the way that he's painting. Right, these really long fingers, again, really accentuate the, the boniness of this, of this figure, right? Just wanted to count those fingers, make sure I didn't have too many. I guess it's his left foot, yeah. <laughs> even though it's on the right. Okay, interesting.
softening up. A little bit, almost like a bit of a dry brush technique there. And in here, like, look at all the colors we see in here. There's purples and greens and pinks. There's a lot. It's quite a complicated thing that he's creating down here. But Okay, let's just take a little quick uh, check in and see how it looks so far. All right, so we're getting a lot of the colors. Is um, and again, that's also because we used the we started with the the proper cold colors in the background, warm colors in the foreground, and then I painted warm colors on top of the cold colors in the background and then I painted cold colors on top of the warm colors in the foreground right so we're we're breaking the rules just like Picasso was doing you know he was um, an iconoclast in in every way good and bad um, so now let's uh, let's go to the let's brighten this up <coughs> We've got glazing fluid here. Add some white. <coughs> Excuse me. <coughs> let's, let's go right to the head. I'm just going to use, you can use any brush for this really, the softer the brush the better it works, but and kind of, um, and I have a brush I use specifically for blending uh, glazes, right, this is my mop brush, like to mop a floor brush, and it works really well, but I'm just also, I know that not everyone has all of the tools I'm using, so I always try to Show that we can do this with all of the basic tools in our acrylic painters toolbox. All right, so this glazing, we can just soften up the edge ever so slightly so it doesn't look so hard and severe. So I think we'll probably come back here and do a little bit more. So I think I want to add some green on here first before I do too much more highlights. That's pretty good for right now, right? 
Actually, maybe before I move on, I'm just gonna go back to my darker blue. Let me just get this eye here. Okay, in fact, why don't I add a little bit of um, cool yellow in here. So let's take a bit of this cool yellow. Let's just mix it in here ever so slightly till we get a kind of a green. We've got this kind of sickly greenish color on here, right? It makes him look like he's like on the verge of death, right? As you can imagine why collectors coming into Ambrose Villard's gallery are like, uh, yeah, I mean, I guess it's kind of well painted, but shoo, I mean, I don't know if I want that on my wall at home. Like, that's kind of disturbing. <laughs> Good. Okay, let's, I see on the shoulder over here, we've got a bit of this greenish tint. Okay, likewise, let's take a look at these fingers. Right, that one pinky finger is just popping up. We'll go darker uh, after this pass. Let's check out this arm. Just little bits of this green. on that green so I'm just gonna back off and just get go back to some white
on trucking here. We're getting, we're doing pretty good. I know it's a little slow, but you know, we're recreating one of the great paintings of all time. And I think we're doing a pretty good job of, of getting the, the important details in here too, so. So those big long fingers. I think that's a really important part of this painting. Uh, the toes. Oh yes, very green. Look, look how greenish these legs are in the toes. I mean, there is a potential that some of this is from a glaze or a varnish that was done afterwards. You know, infamously, a lot of paintings have been altered by, by people who meant well at the time, trying to conserve paintings. Um, and so I'm not sure. I mean, this definitely just has, looks like it's been weathered or something has happened on, on this painting. details here. Again, just put a little bit more glazing fluid on there. And now I can get just a little bit more transparency. thing too is I can just go over top of darker areas with a glaze put put it in place and then just wipe it away and it'll leave a it'll kind of tint it a bit leave a little bit of pigment but not necessarily brighten it up as severely as one might expect if we were if there wasn't any glazing fluid actually in there like what I'm just doing right here. Applying a bit of this greenish haze onto haze and I'll darken that shortly. Okay, so let's take a look. You know, I think I might need to go even wilder with this yellow. I mean, it's funny, like, when I paint this green here, it, it has a bit of, like, a fluorescent... It looks like fluorescent green paint or something. As I go, I'll let this dry, and then we're going to darken it back, and it will, it'll disappear a little bit. It won't be quite so severe if you're like, whoa, I don't know about that. It's a little bit too green. Um...
Okay, so I think now I'm going to go back one last time over the body with some darker colors, a darker glaze. Then we're going to do the darker colors or the lighter colors, like some of the folds on the clothes. Then we'll do a final glaze of some darker, we'll just sort of rub it in in a few places and then we'll be done. So I'm anticipating within the next 45 minutes of, of starting to wrap up. Which, depending on <laughs> your field of view, you may see, think of that as a long time or a short time. I don't know. <laughs> I'm, every day there's different comments on these YouTube videos. Some people saying they're way too long, they need to be shorter. And then on my short videos, people saying, oh, these are way too fast, they need to be much longer. <laughs> like, that's why I just do what I do. And there's people will find them, and some people love them. If they don't like them, that's okay, right? And I, that's one of the most important lessons I've learned as an artist, is you cannot satisfy everyone. You can satisfy some of the people. It's like you know, it's like uh, that you can fool some of the people some of the time, right? So you could you can please some of the people some of the time, but you can't please all of the people all of the time. And every time I've tried to make art that I think everyone will like, almost inevitably nobody wants it. People want to see a, a point of view for, I think for an artist, you need to, you need to take a position, right? And you need to, to direct the audience to, to what you want, right? When you're telling a story, you know, almost be obvious with a kind of a theme. That's my thing. I always think, I remember I had a teacher when I was in graduate school who said, you know, I'm sick and tired of people always saying like, oh, it's whatever you think it is. Use it. I, I don't want to tell people what to think. And he's like, he made us all do paintings. We said, I want you to make a painting that is obvious like obvious like advertising you look at it and you know what it is because i'm sick and tired of everyone coming in here saying oh I, you know you whatever you think it is it's that's okay with me right take a position right great art forces us to to often answer confront deep things within ourselves right um Okay, so I was going to go darker, so let's go darker. Let's take our glazing fluid into this darker area here. I think we're probably pretty good with the face. You know, I could spend more time in here. darker and then I take a rag and just dab it up lighten it up a little bit All right uh again.
It's not about wiping it all away. It's just sort of leaving little bits of things. Okay, that might be okay. Shoulder, how do we feel about the shoulder here? Maybe a little bit darker on this side. And then just softening that side up a bit. Let's get underneath. And this hand is sort of dissolving into the darkness of that side of the picture, right? I'll let that dry, and I think I'll, I'll uh, I want to do a little bit darker on on the hand here. So let's just motor down to the other hand so once again this is cool blue that I added some warm red to to make my darkest color. I haven't used any black. There's not a drop of actual black anywhere in this painting. Neither on my canvas nor his, right? He's not using any black here. It looks like it in some places, but it's not. It's a really dark mixture of colors. fluid again taking this dark color and some glazing fluid and then we can put it down underneath here subtle 
darkening this one side a little bit. Okay, and just while I'm, I've got that, I'm going to come back up to this hand and do the same thing. I'm just going to go back over this right side here and darken that and add just a bit more nuance into these fingers. Okay. <laughs> you guys are talking about becoming senior citizens. That's pretty funny. Um, let's just go a little bit darker here before I glaze this. So, you know, I know that at different times of this painting, it seemed like we were a long way away from, from being done. And it seemed like a number of unnecessary layers, I suppose some people might say. But hopefully, you know, as the painting evolves, you can kind of see like, oh, I see now why we did a little bit of that. It's because it's the, it's the cumulative layering of paint that makes many of the most famous paintings throughout art history work. You know, some people, they want the easy, fast way of doing it, which is, you know, that's just how we live in, in today, right? We want everything to be done quickly and painlessly uh, so we can get back to Netflix. Um, but the reality is, is, you know, quality takes time and you gotta, like, be a bit patient and one of the great things that I one of my favorite things with painting is it forces me to slow down right this is just no you just you have to be patient otherwise you're just gonna drive yourself bonkers bit of uh, extra dried paint sometimes especially towards the end of a painting like this gets kind of scooped up use a much larger brush to do some of these well we'll do a combination get a little bit more
So let's once more zoom back out and just take a inventory and see how things are going. Pretty good. I mean, I mean, I, I would say if anything, like it's the guitar that now that seems um, that drives me the most bonkers. But you know, I think it looks definitely a little bit more red on camera than it is in person it's definitely much warmer than the guitar he had I could continue to add some cooler brown glazes over top but I don't think it's it doesn't bother me t t enough to want to make a, a big deal out of it so let's now we're gonna do the clothing and then do a little bit of darker glazing over in here and then we'll be done okay So who's making today's painting with me? Is there anyone out there who's actually painting this painting? Or are people working on other things and just hanging out? Which is totally fine. I love when people just tune in and hang out with me and we have a little open studio. But I'm also super interested to hear about people who are actually painting today's painting and how it's going. Is there an area that they're struggling with? And maybe we can try to workshop it a little bit and see if there's a solution that we can find. So the fabric again is basically the same colors as the um, as the figures cold blue, especially down here. There might be a little bit of warmer blue up in the clothing up top, the shirt, but really we got cold blue everywhere. So I think what I'm gonna do now, uh, I've, uh, let's I'm gonna mix a bit more of it. So let's take some cold blue and warm red let's just mix this together gets a bit purpley so I'm going to take a bit of cold yellow and that's going to keep it in the more grayer area it's pulling it back towards the neutral core All right so now I've got a nice a, a batch of this color which I can use to maybe to darken but mostly I'm going to use to lighten things so let's get a little bit of white on the palette and then I'm going to just mix the version right here and then I'm going to mix another version that's a little bit lighter over here and I think that's the one I'll end up using and just maybe dab into the other one just to get a bit more but I'll probably do most of my mix in here let's put a bit of glazing fluid in here so that I can blend and smudge or wipe away the paint as needed So I might actually, let's take a bit of this more brighter white. Let's see what this color is. I kind of just scrub it in. Now I think that was originally a bit more of a, um, a warm blue, which is why it looks a little bit different. Same thing, I'm just adding a bit of this.
Okay, so now I'm going, so I was doing a little bit with some of this lighter, and then uh, with it, that's been tinted with some white, and then here I'm going back into the darker areas, because even though that this is lighter, it's going to be in the shadow. And if I go too dark or too light here, I can always darken this down with my next layer of glaze that I'll do to finish the painting off. So I'll, add, I'm, I'll go in and as well and darken a few places. Just like I'm paint in. And then I'm just softening things up with a brush. You can literally kind of just scrub it around a little bit. brush a little bit off onto my hand or onto a rag. That's good. Now I'm now I'm gonna go the opposite direction, I th think. Yeah. So now I'm gonna take this dark color that I have here and we're gonna glaze with that. Alright, so we'll go the opposite direction. And maybe let's go back up into the shirt here.
I'm just going to glaze over top of this and just darken that ever so slightly, right? So we have one side that's definitely got a little bit brighter. Oops, sorry. Let's go down here. And then on the other side, we'll clean up this collar. Here's the little tatter. Okay, now let's go to this hand. Or to the sleeve, I mean. A little problem there that I'll fix with it. Oh, goodness. zeroing in further and further and further getting closer and closer I'd say probably 15 minutes from wrapping up uh, I'm gonna take a bit of lighter blue and come back on here and just widen the sleeve to get around that arm I know it's not as bright as that, but I needed to get there. We'll let that dry. Here. 
Oops, I just realized I went a little overboard there. That's okay. I'll just keep it. We're going to darken underneath the guitar again with just my dark color. Warm blue, or sorry, warm red and cool blue. Just noticing this. leg All right start to feel the the end in sight here Very close. It's a little, you know, it's a little bit lighter, but we're going to glaze a little bit of a darker color over some of these spots just to put this whole painting over the top. So. Oh, yeah. This uh, on the guitar, and there's strings. I forgot about that. I don't think he used, I think it was more of a brown, so let's get a bit of brown into there, just paint over that. Just doing a little bit of 
cleaning up on the guitar. strings are on this guitar here? One, two, three, four, five, six. I thought so, but, you know, don't want to assume anything. It wouldn't have surprised me if there was, you know, if this poor fellow only had three strings or something on there. pretty close, right? So I think the last thing I want to do is um, just a slightly darker glaze in a few places and even back in here. Okay. So um, I think I'm just going to this glaze let's where is a small brush Actually, I'll mix it up with brush here. Okay, so um, this color is just going to be kind of a dark grayish generic color. So let's take some cold blue. Maybe let's do this over here. Even though we've been using this bit, this is the same color down there. Let's just do it up here because everything's getting a little muddy. Put a bit of cool yellow into it. Here we're basically just making a gray. Too much um, yellow, so I'm just going to get rid of that a bit. So I got a really nice dark blue, the same blue that we've been basically using, just maybe a little bit more on the bluer side rather than a kind of gray side. And then let's get some glazing fluid. Oh, that's a, that's a lot, but that's okay. Maybe we'll use a bunch of it. I'm getting it on my brush here, my glazing fluid. And then taking a bit of this paint. Because we can start out really nice and subtle. Right? We don't want to necessarily just, you know, especially at the very end of a painting, people can be like, oh, I've just gotten here. I, I don't know if I want to just start going wild with glazing fluid. Let's just hold on, Markowski. So, um, what I want to do is I'm just going to apply a bit of this in here. And just sort of dirty it up a little bit. We're kind of adding this little bit of a quality. And now I'm just going to use my mop brush. Just this, it's kind of hard to describe, just a little bit of a aged kind of thing that he's got here. I'll probably go a little bit darker, but let's it's okay to start a little bit more on the, on the 
more timid side of things until you get the color you want, right? You're going to take this and go right over top of this blue, right? Similarly, down in here. Maybe not everywhere, but... Can go on top of this right leg and just darken this down a bit. add this shadow back which remember kind of disappeared earlier something on this foot there just gonna go back in and just darken this background up ever so slightly. Right again, I haven't used any black in this entire painting. Not one drip or drop. Let's take this and go. So I love glazing in that we can now just get really fine-tune this painting. I remember I was trying to get this kind of dirty kind of quality. See here's this is the color. I'm gonna put a bit more glazing fluid in there. I ended up using all that stuff that was there. Let's just I think do a little bit another quick pass up here. Again, 
on top of this blue. We get that weird enigmatic kind of bright blue coming through the darker color. Just keep on getting those shadows darker, making this more and more of a moody picture, right? Which is exactly what it is. Are we uh, are we done? <laughs> I think I think I'm done. But every time I say that, I'm like, ah, you could do a little more here. It's just dangerous. These paintings they suck you right in, and before you know it, hours of your life disappear. If you're thinking about getting into painting and you're just watching, probably a bad idea because then you're just gonna love it so much that you won't stop painting. So. the most dangerous hobby of all. It's very, very addictive. <laughs> and then you find yourself becoming an artist and making it your career. And then it's all hope is lost, right? Okay, I think that's good enough, right? <laughs> so, um, yeah, it feels great. So let's uh, finish up. Okay. This is also a new brand of uh, canvas panel I'm trying out, and we'll see how they turn out and if I want to recommend them to people. So I'll let you know 
over the next few weeks. We'll see. <laughs> Donis is good enough for a government worker. That is true. Okay, everyone. Um... Lolly says, wow, Michael, that's truly looking gorgeous. Love what you've done to make this one. Uh, <laughs> Donna says, you are hopeless, Michael, but a good hopeless. <laughs> okay. Um, so thank you, everyone, for joining and painting with me again tonight. Uh, remember that we'll just kind of quickly take a look that tomorrow we're going to be painting child with a dove this is another blue period painting then on thursday we're going to be painting this painting this is from his next this is from the rose period it's uh, harlequins which he started doing kind of towards the end of the blue period and then i think it's on friday we're moving into his cubist phase so these three musicians and then I think on Monday, on his birthday, we are going to be painting Weeping Woman, which is a study for one of his Guernica paintings. And then, of course, this Wednesday, in just a, a couple of days, we're going to be painting Bigfoot, just because it happens to be a very important day in the history of Bigfoot. We'll talk all about that on Wednesday. Uh, please like and subscribe to the channel so that you know when upcoming videos are taking place, because sometimes I'm not always on Tuesdays and Thursdays at 4 o'clock, which is where I've been every Tuesday and Thursdays for the past year and a half, really. Um, but, uh, you know, today is not a Tuesday, and here I am. Uh, Wednesday is not a Tuesday, and there I'll be Friday and Saturday and Sunday, or as far as I know, not Tuesdays either, right? But I will be there because today, this week is Pablo Picasso week. So hopefully you'll be with me throughout the week. Maybe you pop in and say hello. If you want to support the channel, a great way to do it is just by liking the video that you're watching right now or in other videos you may have watched in the past that you also like. You can subscribe to the channel, hit that notification bell. We just passed 10,000 subscribers, I think, late last night. So thank you so much for all of the wonderful people who have been following me on this journey and the new people that are have joined up. Join the Facebook group. Upload your version of today's painting to the Facebook group. If you want to leave a donation, there's a PayPal link below. You want to send a check or money order. There's my email on my website, or you can contact me through the Facebook group as well. And all of your donations just go directly back into the show, as you know, I've, I've mentioned many, many times. Thank you, everyone. We'll see you guys uh, tomorrow for another episode in our uh, Pablo Picasso series. Have a good night or good morning, wherever you are on planet Earth. We'll talk to you then. Bye-bye.